I get to interview a lot of people and they all have their own opinions on what the most dangerous invasive species is to our local waterways. But I want to hear from you guys. For the next couple of weeks, there's going to be a poll up on my YouTube channel. You can pick from the snakehead, the blue catfish, the flathead catfish, the grass carp, or the Alabama bass. If none of these are what you consider the most dangerous for our local waterways, just comment down below in the comment section and I'll put that on my spreadsheet. Again, this poll is going to be up for the next couple of weeks. Please go vote. It really would help me just try to figure out where people stand on what they think the most threatening thing is to our waterways. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And guys, you've been really wanting me to just to branch out more. And it's been part of my bucket list is I really want to have anglers and guides from all four corners of Virginia on the show on either a monthly or bi-monthly rotation to talk about things. And I was lucky enough with, with Captain Chaconis, who's a who's a regular on our show. He was hounding me that I have to get this guy on the show. He texted me a bunch of times. And when I went down to his house for Christmas, he's like, dude, you got to get him on. And that's how I got here with Captain Matt Miles of Matt Fly Fishing. Matt, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Now, now you and the Upper James River, this is a thing that I've been wanting to talk about for a long time. It, it's one of those rivers that it's so interesting because I feel like it, it it doesn't get the love it deserves when it comes to so many fish species, but particularly mm. smallmouth. You mm. got the new, you got the Upper Potomac, mm. you got the Shenandoah. No love for the James. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not as much as it should be. The new, the new really got um, promoted hard. I, I mean, it, it is a great fishery, um, and it has the room to grow some really big smallmouth. But so does James. But the the new had a, a lot of press, and um, it's amazing how many clients still call me and uh, never fish with me that say, "Hey, what about the new? I really want to fish the new river." And I'm like, "Well, you know, I got something a little bit closer we can do." You know, that's just in my opinion just as good. And um and I fish I fished the the James my whole life since age 5 is my earliest memory of catching a smallmouth bass with my dad. It's actually a funny story. I was worm fishing like most kids do. And um we were fishing this eddy off a bank and uh all of a sudden, you know, pole bends. I set the hook. This giant bass comes out of the water. My dad actually jerks the rod out of my hand, thinking I can't land it. And he breaks it off. So, oh, I, I have a very, for some reason, I have a very good memory about fishing, and that's the earliest memory I have. I was probably, you know, five. So, and uh, I fished anew. Uh, actually, my mother grew up over there, so I spent a lot of time over there as a kid too, visiting. And uh, so I, I've, I've spent a lot of time on that river as well. Not as much in my older years, but a lot, uh, a lot in my younger years. It, it's crazy. And I, I tell people this all the time, especially when I get to the DNR guys. Uh, um, we have such a crazy fishery where you can have a pure smallmouth river tournament trail and you could start on like the Roanoke and go to the new and then the James and then the upper Rappahannock and then the upper mm -hmm. Potomac Shenandoah and, like, and, and this last one. It's insane the amount of river smallmouth fisheries we have here. And I, I besides maybe Tennessee-ish area, I don't know anywhere else that has so many unique opportunities to fish for smallmouth in creeks and rivers. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the funny thing is I don't, I have never really branched out very far out of the state of Virginia to fish for smallmouth. I actually fished P PA for the first time like two years ago. And um, other than maybe West Virginia, I think that was the first smallmouth I've caught out of the state of Virginia. And the only reason I say West Virginia, because, you know, the new cross the state lines. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, I mean, you know, PA's got some great fisheries and tribs and uh, to the Susquehanna and all that stuff. So in Tennessee and then I think Virginia is, is <sighs> quietly been known as a great smallmouth state. Um, and but I think it's getting, you know, more recognized, um, especially as more people promote it and guys like me and other guides start talking about it more it gets more recognition now and uh we do have you know great fisheries we have beautiful fisheries you know it's not just yeah. you know you're floating down beautiful rivers rolling hills mountains um some of the piedmont areas um uh, every one of them have something a little bit different you know different characteristics uh to whether it's where the fish hold or how they look you know and, and you can learn something from every one of them you know that can be used in different fisheries 
and that was my experience going to uh, Pennsylvania was where the fish held um, because the river was uh, the banks like we really geared towards the banks here you know um, especially in the summer months and uh, the banks there were like very shallow so the fish would just sit off way off bank you know on depressions or rocks and uh, so you had to adjust which I think that's really fun because I like seeing different things oh yeah um, it's it's good when you have a lot of different rivers because you kind of learn something you know from all of them even though so they have the same how did fish you... species so how did you get started on this crazy journey of saying like you know what I want to I want to guide for a living <laughs> well it it kind of fell in my lap in, in some ways so that was one of those teenagers that wasn't happy with where he was from uh virginia and i decided at probably 16 17 that when i graduated high school i was moving and i did um three months after graduation i moved to the state of colorado and first time i've ever been there just lived in the camper shell for a couple weeks till i found a place to live and uh just mainly just trout fished in and uh you know did the typical thing got a job at ski resort and i was kind of in between jobs when ski season was over so i had like a month off and i was kind of living on a tax return and i was just fishing every day and i kept running in this guy that was a fishing guide i didn't really didn't know what a guide was till i went really went out west and um we began to talk and you know throughout the summer we'd see each other and say hello and and at the end of summer he would always eat lunch my well the guy's name is pat doris he's a very well known uh guide in colorado and uh he would always eat lunch on a certain tree so at lunchtime i just walked by ed klein so i said hey you know i'd like i think i'd like to be a fishing guy and i think i was 19 at this time and uh and we kind of talked and stayed touch and fished all winter and next year in april I, you know i was 20 years old he he gave me the chance and, you know, taught me, you know, how to conduct myself and how business is done and, you know, how to teach people. So that's how, that's how I began. And I stayed out there for eight years and then moved back to Virginia. Um, and when I came back here, this was before Facebook, Instagram, I had the internet just started. Um, to give you an idea, I'm 45. So at that time, <clears throat> the only the only way I saw to make a living was to be affiliated with a fly shop, especially if you're a fly mm -hmm. fishing guy, right? And um, so I did it part time. And then once Instagram, you know, Instagram, social media and all that, the internet and everything kind of came about, I saw I saw the, that I could make a living as a fishing guy without having a, to own a fly shop, a retail store which sometimes can hurt you because, you know, you got to sell product, right? So uh, that's how I got where I am now. You know, I, I uh, just did a part-time for a number of years. And then once I, I saw I could do it and make a good living at it, you know, I, uh, I started my business, uh, I guess, 12, 12 or 13 years ago now, something like that. Dang, dude, you, you, you've been at it a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, guiding totally, uh, you know, counting the part-time years, 25 years. What, what, how has the industry changed, especially in your area of the country? Um, well, the well, one thing I will say about Virginia, it's gotten better. But one thing I will say about our state, as far as what I do, you know, I guide trout, smallmouth, striped bass. That's a spring fishery for me and smallmouth bass or my main, my main fisheries. We're not a destination. You know, we're not Colorado, we're not Montana. Uh, we're not Texas or wherever, you know, you think of large mouth, that kind of stuff. So, you know, you, you know, I built my business on, uh, you know, locals or people passing through. And, and Virginia, in my opinion, is just a hard state to pull clientele from other places because it's not known as a destination. Yeah, we have people that travel through for, you know, various reasons, but you don't have a lot of tourism as far as, you know, vacations and stuff, you know. And, um, but uh, I've seen it grow. You know, we have way more fishing guys than I've ever, gosh, when I started, it's 
it wasn't a lot here, but now there's a lot of fishing guides. So there's a lot of, and 2020 was part of that. You know, it, mm. and a lot of people were busy because there were so many people wanting to get outside, but, uh, it, it's, it's getting better, you know, um, as, as, a uh, as a year round fishery too, you know, we have four distinct seasons. Uh, unfortunately we can't really have much success with smallmouth fishing in the winter. I mean, you can go out there and catch some on the right days, but it's not something I target just because I'm just too impatient to fish that slow. So I change with every season I change. So I got trout fall, winter, spring, and then musky fall, winter. And then once it starts warming up, then I start doing other things like striped bass and smallmouth bass. So for the James River, then how do you break it up? I mean, I know, of course, you have the tidal basin and all that. And when you say trout mm-hmm. waters, I'm assuming you're talking way up into the head near. Well, yeah, um, you're talking about tributaries. Like, so the Jackson and Cow Pasture make the James. All right. So when they come together, that's the Iron Gate area. Uh, the Jackson is a tailwater, uh, meaning it comes out of Lake Moomaw. So it's a cold water release. And that uh, is cold enough to, you know, support trout. So that's one of my main trout fisheries. Uh, the Cow Pasture. <clears throat> has some stocking on it but it's it's not like a year-round trout fishery like the jackson is because the cold water and then you have creeks and stuff throughout the you know all the way from iron gate down to here where i live in amherst virginia um that you have different creeks that you know you have uh stock trout streams and you also have wild brook trout streams and stuff like that that enter the james so I don't know if you can see my screen, but there's Lynchburg mm-hmm. right there. Yep. Yep. I'm just, just a teeny bit north of that. Good Lord, dude. So you travel. <laughs> Holy shit. That's a lot of river. Yeah. I mean, the furthest, the, the start of the James at Iron Gate is like an hour and 20 minute drive. I was trying to say, like, where the hell is Iron Gate? It's uh, up near Clifton Forge. Big Island. Snowden. Natural bridge. Oh my God. Yeah. It's a lot of water that, I mean, I, I'm just blown away and guys, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to be able to see this. Cause like, I don't know a lot about the James. I, I pretty, I have a good handle on the upper Potomac Shenandoah Susky. And this is a lot of water. Cause again, I know about the, the, the title James proper because Bassmaster has been there for the last 150 years, but yeah. I, I didn't realize the James. Let me rephrase this. If you're guiding, this is a shit ton of real estate for you to cover. I mean, whether it's gas or boat, like, do you just pick different segments based on like it's trout? So I'm only going to be driving this way or like, I guess, how far is your radius from traveling from home to where you launch? The furthest, the furthest I drive in one day is two hours, one way. Okay. So most of my, yeah, most of my fisheries are an hour and a half and under. Okay. And also also depends on what, what time of year it is and what I'm fishing for. So oh, like I can be on the James for smallmouth in 20 minutes from where I live. Um, and so I cover, I don't know how, I, I need to figure out, figure out the miles, but I, I, I know the James river um, from the start all the way down to an area called uh, Bremo bluff, which is below Scottsville. And that's a lot of, that's a lot of water. Um, but you know, growing up here and f- just fishing it all now, I have my favorite sections and where, you know, and, yeah. I, and you know, where I want to fish and where I feel like I'm going to put clients on the, the bigger fish. Um, and I also like a lot of fishermen, I don't like crowds. So if sections of rivers are crowded at different times, I won't, I won't go there. I'll just go somewhere else. You know, I have enough water that I can be, um, you know, just move around and just, you know, just be deserved. Des- eh, I can't speak diversified you know and just get on different water and stay away from the big crowds and stuff like that so this is a dumb question but i'm assuming you got a jet right you're not paddling uh yeah i will i have three boats i have uh oh, i have a white rotter raft that's set up for fishing i can take two anglers i'm in the middle rowing then i have what we call a drift boat which is a hard style boat dory is another term for it um <clears throat> same thing angler front and rear i'm in the middle rowing with casting it has casting braces so you can stand uh it also has seats and then i also have a a 16 foot jet uh outboard uh that i use i also run a trolling motor or run oars on as well um so i'm i'm limited to two anglers per boat so 
but those are my boats. And that covers that way I can cover the smallest tributaries, the shallow tributaries with a raft. And then the bigger rivers, if they're low and the jet is not a good option, then I'm gonna drift with a drift boat. That's and brilliant. Then, yeah, and I don't to be totally honest with you, I don't use the jet a lot for smallmouth fish. I use it a lot for musky and guiding striped bass, but um it's something about the summer I just like floating. I just like drifting and just seeing a lot of different water. It's quiet. I'm approaching fish quieter. I don't have to worry about hitting things. Um, you know, like I would in the jet. You know, I'd have to worry about where I'm running and where I can get to. Um, and then one of my biggest fears would be, you know, starting a guide trip and then running up and smacking something and, and messing up my day and then I can't fish anymore. So when I'm drifting like that, I don't have to worry about that stuff. You know, I'm going to be there all day. That makes so much sense. And then yeah. guys, before we, we started recording, we we're talking about fly fishing and now it's just, it's a light bulb. When you say you do so much fly fishing and fly fishing culture, I mean, up there near Lake Moomaw and Jackson river, like that is trout mm -hmm. city. So it makes so mm -hmm. much more sense now. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And the, you know, the beautiful thing about the James river is it's not a, you know, far as fly fishing goes, it's not a deep river. It's not a new river. The new river's got just, gigantic drop-offs and ledges and stuff and you know as a fly fisherman one of our biggest challenges is actually getting deep you know getting the fly down to a fish quickly if we have to now if fish are aggressive sitting shallow and stuff like that we don't have to worry about it but you know if we're fishing cold water or like pre-spawn stuff sometimes we have to get have to get our flies down quickly and if they're not willing to move it's much harder to take a fly and bounce it in front of a fish's face like a ned rig you know, Ned Rig is much easier. I can just leave it there or two. Um, so the James being a wide and shallow river, it's a really good river for fly fishing as well as conventional tackle um, because um, the fish don't have as much walk depth depth to hide in or and stuff like that. Now we have deep holes, but we have a lot of wide, shallow water that makes it much easier to target as a fly fisherman. That's crazy. That's crazy. Cause I just, I never would have thought about all the fly fishing opportunities and how important that would be that if you have mm -hmm. a deeper body of water, especially if, if you're trying to take out a novice too, like it yeah. seems like it's a lot yeah. more friendly to beginners. Yeah. And also, you know, with small mouth, it really depends on what time of year we're fishing. Um, now I could take an experienced angler and take them out anytime from pre-spawn, which is March. You know, I usually don't fish to them on during the spawn, but March through uh, end of November is what I'll typically fish smallmouth for. And so, you know, if I have a, you know, experienced caster, I don't have any problem fishing them any time. But if I have a beginner angler or newer to fly fishing, I want to take him out more in the summer months when the fish are going to be shallower and more active, that sort of thing. That way they're going to get more opportunity and they don't have to rely on how far they can cast and that sort of thing. So right Right now, is this trout slash musky season? Yeah. Then we're technically yeah. in? Yeah, technically, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and right now, <clears throat> you know, as far as, you know, you're dealing with cold. I mean, it's winter, right? We're dealing with water temperatures, you know, anywhere from 44 to 42, which for trout, even though they're cold water fish, 42 is cold, and so they're not eating as well. So we've got to work for everything we catch. You know, and musky typically, if the water temperature stays above 42, you have a, you know, a decent shot. Uh, you get below 42, then you're you're really having to just almost bounce off the bottom and get lucky and that sort of thing. But um, it just depends on water temperatures, which this winter hasn't been bad. Other than that really cold spell, we had a winter, I mean, at Christmas, you know, where we had temperatures in single digits and zero with wind. Um, it, hasn't, it hasn't been a bad winter at all. We just could use a little more rain than we've been getting. We've been just getting a lot of little teeny rains and not real substantial rain. It's just been a weird winter. It also felt like fall didn't really like end or start till like December-ish. Like it was just yeah. really Well, it got cold early. You know, October, you know, we had we had frost. It's uh I remember in October. So that's not normal. Or what we typically see. I mean, I'm sure it's supposed to happen that way, but we don't really see that anymore. And so it was it got much colder early this year than we normally have 
and then it warmed back up and then we'd get cold again, that sort of stuff. What has the population uh, of musky been like on the river? Cause I know there was a while there that you never heard about musky fishing in, in the James. And I'm going to tie this into smallmouth real quick, but sure. all of a sudden you have this massive musky population that was introduced by, you know, DWR um, mm. to try to create a, a market, let's just say like that, a market for yeah. that sports fish. And, and you being an individual who I'm assuming it, you, you've been guiding this river before the muskie really came in there. Have you seen a big change in the smallmouth have like how they behave or their population? Has it affected as much as let's say like a flathead or the snakehead or something like that? Um, so a little history on the muskie. It was actually stocked in 1972 it was the first stocking in the James. Um, so they've been there a long time. Uh, and they stocked all the way to in 2009 is what I was told. And I used to actually help some with the stock, uh, shocking, uh, which was a lot of fun. Oh, wow. But, uh, yeah, so they quit, they quit stocking in 2009 because they were reproducing on their own in the James, which is really cool because a lot of the muskies we catch now are just, they're wild fish. And uh, they can grow, you know, large and they can live very, very old. Um, so... You know, the funny thing about the muskie is you heard rumors, you know, when you were younger and you might see one or two sitting on a creek once in a while, but I just didn't know anyone to fish for, them, you know, and I didn't even know what you would fish with, you know, and I had a few take smallmouth flies and, you know, of course, cut me off because I'm not running wire and stuff like that. But um, and then it got, you know, really popular. I don't know what year. But it got, you know, started getting really popular. Uh, it was it was really good fishing because the fish just weren't fished too that much. And the guys that did fish for them, they didn't talk about it. Um, I meet guys now that are old enough to be my father, you know, 70 some years old that go, yeah, I've been fishing this thing before people knew they were here. And they just didn't talk about it. So, but, you know, everything came out, you know, social media guides started promoting it um and that and that brought it brought it out now as far as <clears throat> to the muskie hurt the smallmouth population uh, i'm not sure and they did studies that said you know they did a study through virginia tech i guess i don't know how many years it's been now but they said nine percent of their diet was a smallmouth bass um the biggest problem I see with a muskie, if we lost our suckers for some reason, like our fall fish or hog sucker, then they're going to target smallmouth more often. But uh, as long as the food's there, I think they're safe. Um, I do think, you know, I do hear more about guys hooking smallmouth and losing it to a muskie. I hear about that more often now. Uh, personally, I've only had it happen a couple of times. But one of the smallmouth sections I fish is not heavy with muskies. The upper river is like when I say upper, I just mean like we can in that area. There's there's uh, the muskie population is much higher, so you have a bigger chance of running into other you know having a fish take a, a, a fish that you're fighting up there than I do down where I primarily smallmouth fish. Yeah, it's crazy because like so many people think like the muskie population like is going to decimate everything in its path because it's a big fierce predator but it's crazy where we're where we're at with the upper potomac having flathead catfish in it the susquehanna having issues and there's data showing that like yeah this is actually adjusting the behavior of smallmouth they don't winter as deep as they used to they do have bite mm -hmm. marks on them and it's just it's just so interesting because everyone would look at the muskie and be like, no, this thing's going to completely destroy the river or decimate it. And it's like that's kind of found a, it's see at least in our rivers up here, it's found mm -hmm. its niche in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And people don't talk about like the catfish or how that thing can actually go in there and just blow things up. Yeah, I think we're going to have a real problem with catfish and not only in our rivers, just everywhere. I was actually. <clears throat> Funny, we talked about this, but uh, a friend of mine called me today. That's a, a fishing guy in Outer Banks. Well, what he does in the winter is he just got a uh, a job running trot lines to sell catfish commercially. 
And that's okay. because they're over, they're overrunning, they're, they're overtaking everything, you know? Um, I mean, you look at the Chesapeake Bay, you know, the blue crab problems. Uh, uh, we talked to a guy the other day that caught um, some blue cats last year that had six and like eight inch stripers in their stomachs, you know, when he cleaned them. So catfish are going to be, you know, I hate to say it, the death of some fish if we don't do something about it. Um, you know, whether it's a blue cat, which is probably the worst because they're basically uh, considered an invasive fish now. Um, the flathead is, in my opinion, far as a smallmouth river, is the worst fish we could have in the river. Um, from what I understand, the only river we have in the state that, well, major river is the new river that the, the flathead is actually native to. So the other rivers were actually, they were put in there, whether it was done legally or illegally, I don't know. But I see those big catfish cruise. I see them cruise the shallows. I mean, big, big, uh, over 40 inch flatheads. Damn. And I know what they're, I know what they're up to. You're, you're not cruising through two feet of water in the summertime against the bank looking for, you know, crawfish. <laughs> you're looking for a mm. smallmouth or brim or whatever that may be laid up against the banks during that time. That always uh, blows my mind how certain rivers like the Mississippi proper, the new river, you can have all these species living in harmony, no problem, but that you get introduced somewhere else. It's like, what, what, what's missing in our rivers that they can't just get all get along. Yeah, you know, it's just weird how some places it, it works and some places it just doesn't. Yeah, I mean, I, I think too is whether you know do do you have a a lot of bait fish for all of them to feed on? So if you have a river that has a lot of food like suckers, shad, or something like that, then then they can all kind of get along because they're not going to be trying to eat each other as badly. I guess if you have a, a a big food source, but if you get into an area where you don't have that or all the catfish have eaten up well game fish is the next on the menu so um and i and i see it i see it in different sections of river i see the sections that have less fish because it just seems like there's a higher catfish population you know whether you know usually because i see them you know i mm -hmm. see the catfish um you know in the summer months you know i can find catfish in real shallow water fast water and stuff like that um and then you have sections where you don't see as many um so uh but i i think that's going to be a real problem i don't think muskies is anything for anyone to worry about as far as uh, uh smallmouth is concerned and i'm not just saying that because i guide for them uh i just don't see them targeting them like a catfish will um i think catfish is going to be our our number one problem now, on that depressing note, guys, we're going to go to the, the funner part of the show, which is, you know, what we all came here, which is those big old bronze footballs. And I'm, mm -hmm. dude, like you got your Instagram as I was creeping on it, you got some really nice pics of some nice bronze footballs. Mm -hmm. Like how is how is a smallmouth population right now in the new? I mean, you look at these fish right here, like you have on your Instagram. I mean, they're they're, they're healthy. Like, what do you think the state of the river is in right now for the smallmouth population? Well, I think it, it's going to vary a little bit too. Personally, this is, I mean, I'm, when I, I'll just go ahead and clarify, I'm not a biologist. Mm -hmm. I did not go to school <laughs> other than high school. So um, I, I think you have certain sessions that just work better than, they're just doing better than others, you know, whether it's angling pressure um, or maybe too many catfish. And um, what I do is I just seek out those areas that are just better than, than the next one, you know, as far as just what I see visually, what I've learned over all my years. Um, and my number one goal is generally targeting big fish. Um, I like catching fish, don't get me wrong, but there's ways that we can fish, you know, whether it's with a fly or conventional tackle, there's ways we can fish to catch big numbers of fish and there's ways that we can target just bigger fish. And generally, I get most of my clients, they want to, you know, maybe go with less numbers and just target bigger fish. Um, and, uh, you know, once you find those big fish, they're generally in the same area year after year. Um, 
I do know smallmouth move around some. I think some move a lot further than others, and some are just more homebodies. Um, I talked to a guy I know that actually did a study. They put a couple transmitter in his fish. Um, they had majority of the smallmouth would kind of just hang out where they actually put it in, and then they had one fish that went like eight miles. So, wow. you know, it's just – different personalities i think you know just like animals animals have different personalities like we do so uh they do move around um but uh finding areas that uh you know you know seek i seek out those big fish uh, where i've caught them years after year and if i'm not finding them there then i just start looking you know elsewhere but uh, like i said earlier i really target areas where there's less people um, we have a growing number of anglers, which is great. It's good for business, but it's also, you know, more angling pressure we have, the more uh, mortality we have, the more the fish will adapt and learn. And so I just seek out the areas where I find less people. Uh, I may find less fish at times, but I'm, I'm, I'm also fishing. I may be finding big fish and that's why I'm doing it. I mean, you also got a, a massive portion of the river, and I, mm. I don't know if you're like familiar with like the sh you compared it to like the New River, but if you look at the Shenandoah, the Upper Potomac, and Susquehanna is like nothing like on the planet. But is this a? You said it's right. shallow. Is it a narrow river or is it wide? And what's it no, it, like? The only narrow section would be up up in the beginning. Um, in <sighs> it depends on your definition of narrow, but uh, I mean take up there in the where it starts you know you're looking at uh less than 100 yards wide but as it goes it gets wider and wider and some of the areas i fish it's up to you know two three hundred yards wide um so the you do have deep holes but you have these long stretches of ledges and um you know just flats that can be really bank to bank and then you'll just all of a sudden have a deep hole and it comes back out in the shallow um, a lot of diversity islands and, and whatnot um you know like the new you can kind of you know the section below clater anyways you know downstream between clater and west virginia you know you can have these real nice shallow areas and ledges and stuff and then all of a sudden you look down oh we can't see the bottom anymore you know it just drops mm -hmm. out and and um the river's big and wide there too and you know the with that river with it being big and wide and having some you know real deep spots you really just have to learn that 10 percent of what the fish want to be in and where they want to be at certain times of year just like we do on all 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 our rivers but um the james just has a lot of shallow water and generally <clears throat> what smallmouth do in, in in virginia anyways i'm, I'm not going to speak for everywhere um, they are a edge fish, fish that likes a hard edge. Hard edge could be rock, bank, could be an old log. They don't like new logs, but dead logs. Um, and so if we target the bank, which is the biggest edge of all, we're going to find fish, especially in the summertime, because you have the shade, uh, you have the food, you have bugs falling out of the trees, you have the the bait fish hiding you have uh the crayfish um so if we target the banks which is the hard edge we're always going to find fish we don't have to focus on that middle part of the river so much unless for some reason they're just not on the bank that day but generally what i find if, I, if the fish aren't in feeding areas like the banks holding on structure they're not feeding so you can go out in the middle and fish deeper holes and search for them. And yeah, you might find some Ned rig would be a good way to go about it versus fly fishing. But, uh, but if the fish are feeding, they're going to be where they want to, they want to find the food or where they're going to find the food the easiest. And uh, I look at the river as just a big conveyor belt, just bringing food right down the current, right down the banks. You know, it's amazing what I find in fish when I catch them, you know, fish will regurgitate sometimes what they just ate when you land them. I have found uh, carpenter ants in 20 inch smallmouth mouth, you know, carpenter, just, ant. you know, yeah, just, you know, eight, you know, little eight, you know, I don't know, half an inch or less, 
just in his mouth, you know, a couple of them where they fell out of the tree. And then like beetles. And you think about all the stuff that's in a tree in the summertime, all the bugs, um, the stuff that falls out. Um, I've seen them hit snakes. I've seen, uh, seen that twice. I saw a little snake, little water snake, you know, just cruising across. I'm like, Oh, that's, he's going to get hit. And sure enough, he did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately I don't have the photo anymore because if I did, I'd definitely share it for you. But, uh, I had a guy catch an 18 and a half venture small mouth on a popping bug. And when we, when I went to land it, I saw something hanging out of his mouth. I was like, what is that? So I land the fish and it, 12 inches of snake hanging out of, his, out of his throat. Just big old water snake. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, I don't have a photo of me anymore, but uh, I had an accident with water damage this summer. <laughs> Wasn't backing up to high cloud. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. And I've seen them eat a bird. You know, I saw fletching one time, um, you know, like early June you know, hit every limb in the tree trying to fly, hit the water, just flapping, and then the bloop, gone, you know. So they they eat all kinds of things in summer, and, and a big fish is not going to pass an easy meal like a little teeny ant because if he doesn't have to work for it, it's, it's just, it's, you know, game for him, whether it's small or not, because he's going to get more of it throughout the day. So It's really crazy. No, it's really crazy when you mention that because I know like Nolan Miner, who's a big uh, kayak angler. I think he, he lives mm -hmm. down your way, but he won mm -hmm. on the Susquehanna River throwing like a, a spider fly popper thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that was part of his pattern. And it, it you just reiterating that like with a big one smoking an ant, it, it, it's insane mm -hmm. what a small mouth, how small and petite of a bait a small mouth will, will consume when they get big. Mm -hmm. So this 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 will help, especially conventional tackle guys that never think about it from a, like my perspective. OK, uh, all fish grow on insects pretty much. Large mouths start out they're eating. They're eating insects when they're little teeny fry. They're eating insects just like trout do. So uh, one of the best ways I, I heard it put was mother's milk. So throughout a, a small mouse life. He's always seeing insects. Whether, you know, it's May, spring, summer, fall, he's always seeing something. There's all kinds of insects, damselflies, dragonflies, mayflies, stoneflies, all kinds of aquatic insects these fish will see. And there's times where, in, in trout fishing, we, we call max a hatch. Um, and there has been times where I've seen these big mayfly hatches come off on a smallmouth river like the James and watched big fish eat them like a trout just sipping real soft and not eat anything else. Now, some of the smaller ones, I've thrown other patterns at them and get them to, to react to it, right? Get them to, you know, reaction strike. So even though we look at smallmouth as this aggressive predatory fish, they can be very lazy and just eat small insects and make a living on that too. So, um, I think understanding that can help anybody, uh, you know, whether you're fly fishing or small bow fishing. Because if you go, you know, you look at tackle stores nowadays, there's all kinds of fly fishing lures that look like bugs now. Um, so there's times like that, the photo of a, uh, that's an annual cicada and then an imitation of it, uh, you know, I've been trying to figure out ways to make one of those to cast on spinner rod for years. <laughs> but, this, uh, was this Brood X when this happened? No, this is annual. This is an annual cicada. Oh, I should probably read so, it. Okay. Every year, every year that one happens. That's the big one. It's, it's a uh, black olive and it has white on its underside. Your, you know, your periodic is, is black and orange. Do you still tie? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I still tie flies. That's got to um, really help with, with fly anglers. Cause I feel like you guys just, you look at the world in a better way than, than guys that just go buy Berkeley worms from Bass Pro Shop. You, mm -hmm. You're so much more detail oriented. You pay attention to more stuff. Yeah. I, I don't know if we necessarily pay attention to the surroundings better, but um, we do pay attention to more detailed stuff like the insects and what we're seeing at that time frame. And when I took that photo, Every year, we have annual cicadas, and 
uh, you know, you hear them singing in the summer, start around July. Well, what happens at the end of like August and September, we start getting colder nights, like 50 degree nights, well, they start dying. And so they start hitting the water. And so those big bass know, well, heck, that's an easy meal. So we'll start throwing, uh, you know, poppers like cork or, or hard flume to make a big splat on the water. And they think it's a cicada that hit the water and it's just an easy meal for them. They don't question it. They just come up and eat it. Um, because, uh, you know, when you're throwing a lure or net or streamer, which is a, you know, fish pattern for a fly, they can chase it. They can look at it. Right. And uh, with the with a bug, they'll come up to it and they'll inspect it. But if everything looks right, they don't have any worries. They'll just go ahead and eat it. You know, and I catch a lot of my big fish that way, especially in the summer months. I catch most of my big smallmouth with fly anglers on on the surface. Um, what months do smallmouth not feed up? I mean, we always think summer is the best month to, to fish top water right. lures. Like besides it was winter, the only time that they, they specifically are, are feeding down. Well, I would say you can, you can start catching them as far as a fly angler, at least anyways. And, and uh sp spin tackle i would say mid may after spawn you can start catching them that way the bug fishing the boogie looking flies and stuff that gets better as summer progresses so i would say the best time is going to be mid june late june on till the end of september uh for the fly type stuff now if you're fishing like uh whopper ploppers or walk the dog or um bait fish style top water in may will work and then as you get into fall the the bugs are less you know less of them they're they're dying off so the the bait fish style stuff comes back into play like whopper ploppers and uh you know you walk the dog and that kind of stuff and i had a really interesting day uh this 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 past year I was fishing uh, very low in clear water in the fall. I can't remember when it was, late October. And we were fly fishing. And I had literally took uh, all my top water flies out. I was like, okay, it's, this is over with. I, I took them out of my box, so I didn't have any. And we were streamer fishing, and I, I kept having fish run up and charge the fly but not eat or bump it and we, we caught some but you know they were just being real um skeptical about killing it and so i was getting frustrated so i started looking through my box and i found a frog <laughs> a hair frog which is a fly and i was like you know i don't know if this is going to work but we're going to try so i turned i tied it on after lunch and we were in a section where the sun was just beating on the bank you know uh just beating right on the bank it's low and clear because I knew the fish were there. They would just run up to my, my streamer and not eat it. So we tried the frog, and my gosh. I mean, we'd land it, pop it one good time, and they would shoot up with aggression and eat it when they would not touch hardly anything underneath. So why, I don't know. What, so made, guess, what made you key in on that? What, what, what about your gut instinct went off saying, like, I need to, to switch to top water? Because they were – with the water being so clear they were questioning it underneath you know they just wouldn't react to it and so the only thing my brain could go to is well what if i approach them from the surface you know where they have they don't have as as much visual you know they're seeing just the underside of something right um and that's what made me switch and i'm glad i did actually my client thought i was full of crap i was like look let's just try it you know Let's just try it. it. Actually, saved our day. We actually caught a lot of fish on it. Got our biggest fish of the day on it. Um, and so I kept doing that until you know we got really cold and the fish were kind of sitting deeper. And then I quit quit doing the top water. I'm just stuck with you know fishing flies or you know underneath you know, underneath water. So that's so cool. That is so cool, guys. There's some good tips right there about never giving up on top water, especially when yeah. your gut tells you. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, you know, there's, you know, guides, you know, guides that, you know, guide for a living and do it full time. We're on the water a lot. So we see a lot of different things. And, um, 
And, and one thing that's in me is I don't like to give up. I don't mind a hard day and I don't like being tricked by fish. So I have a very good, a very hard drive on, on trying to figure it out. And I don't like to give up easily. And thankfully I just had a frog and I was able to try it and it worked. It, and, and so the next few trips after that, I made sure I had top water flies with me uh, for the rest of the rest of my season on it. So creeping on your Instagram account, like where is all these striper coming from? What, what is it like the lower near the tidal portion of the James? Well, I do know actually none of those fish are caught on the James. Now we do have a striper run down in Richmond, you know, uh, where they come up to spawn. Um, so I have two different fisheries. Uh, it's uh, actually the Roanoke river. Um, so Bugs Island Lake is obviously a lot of people know of it or Kerr as a board. It's a, it's a well-known largemouth fishery right on the border. So I have a lake run fish that comes up the Roanoke river or also known as the Stanton locally. They come up in the spring to spawn. So that's one of the fisheries I do. I fish, you know, where their spawning grounds are. And then I go down, uh, late April, I'll go across state lines and I'm actually fishing the Roanoke river below Lake Gaston. And those are, yeah. So what you have up right there are saltwater run fish from, from, uh, Albemarle Sound at Roanoke Rapids area. Dude, that looks like fun. And these are, are these mostly on the fly rod? Yes. Most of them are, but I do, I do either. But most of those are and the cool thing about down there is, 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 is the top water action we can get into early and late in the day. And, uh, I run two trips a day while I'm there. I run morning, like a five hour morning and a five hour afternoon evening. So, uh, I'm able to target, um, uh, fish on the surface as well during the low water or low light period. Um, so that, that's a lot of fun. It's just a lot of, you know, catch a lot of fish. Uh, numbers are high. Those fish swim 130 miles to get there. Uh, so they're strong and they're still strong after they swim all that way. Cause when they get up there, all they do is eat until they're ready to, you know, until the moon hits and, and everything's right. And then they'll start to spawn. Um, so, but until that point they're eating and then when they're done spawning, unless something freaks them out, like low water, they hang around, they keep eating. Um, and and so it's it's a it's a fun time um my largest you know because it's funny when i bring up stripers to people they're like how big are they well i mean i don't fish for stripers because of their size they pull hard as can be but my largest down there has been 15 pounds that's a lot of fun though on a fly rod oh yeah yeah but the biggest i've seen was like 59 that Bullshit. They shot. really no oh no. my I'm god dead serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they sh- they shot to like a 59 right in front of me one day. This was like 10 plus years ago, but uh yeah, they shot they shot some 50s every year. And uh we we had a fish not last season but season before last, so 21 uh my two clients were doubled up on fly. And uh uh Bo goes, "Holy shit." And so I stand up and there's like a 40 plus pounder biting at his fish. And I'm like, "No one's got an extra fly." you know, loose because both of them had fish on. So, um, they're there. You just got, the problem is you got to get through all those male fish to get those big female fish, you know? So, but, uh, numbers, number wise, that's why I do it. Top water and, and you catch a lot of numbers of fish on, on, in one day. We're definitely going to have to have you back on with a striper run so we can start hyping Good. that up. That, that sounds like, dude, that's gotta be insane. That's gotta be so yeah. much fun. It is. It is. It's, it's, it's an easy thing for me to fill, uh, you know, as far as clients go, cause it's just a outstanding fishery. You know, it's just, uh, it's a lot of fun and, uh, it's a, you know, I do it for about, you know, when I'm down there in North Carolina, I spend about three weeks there and I got two a day wow. and then I, then I come back home. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, damn. You're not so. joking. Wow. No, nah, no, nah, it's, it's, uh, it's funny, funny stories. I used to only do two weeks. And then one time my wife looked at my calendar and said, Oh my gosh, you made a lot of money in May. And I said, well, I've been thinking about doing an extra week. She goes, that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I do three weeks down there now. I'd like to do, I'd like to do more, but it is, it's, it is hard, you know, being from home, you know, I wish my home. wife would be like, yeah, you should go out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You should, you should fish for four weeks. Stay away. But, uh, no, it's, it's a good time. 
good fishery. With, with, with us getting into March right now, if people were looking to, to go out with you or to go out on the upper James River, when do you think the smallmouth start converting to that springtime pattern? What do you look yeah, for? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, a lot of it's going to have to do with our, our water temperature and obviously, you know, our weather. But, I, you know, looking back at just history, you know, generally in the first part of March, I'll start, you know, catching fish, um, you know, and I'll usually stop fishing about the time I feel like they're going to start doing the bed thing, you know, getting ready to spawn. So that can be, you know, it, it can vary depending on where you are or what river you're on, but I'd say mid-April. So March to mid-April. Um, now, I will say this about uh, pre-spawn fishing. April is a little more consistent than March. Hmm. And it's obvious why. It's weather, right? So March, March can be a great, great time. Some days you can get some great numbers, but obviously we're there to try to catch those bigger females um, before they spawn. Um, but it can be a very hard time. You know, you can have some low number days. And a lot of that's because the inconsistent weather we have. We have a lot of fronts in March. We have a lot of rain in March. We have temperature swings. So if we can catch, um, you know, a four or five day period of just consistent weather, then it's good. If, you know, I'd say up to three days. If you have three days, it can kind of the same weather. It can be real good fishing. Um, the only bad thing is when you book a trip, you know, you don't always get, you know, you might be there day after front where I'm going to have to work really hard for them. But, uh, you know, March, March is a little more inconsistent, but it doesn't keep me off the river. It just, I just tell people what to expect. You know, I let them know, like, this is what could happen. This is what probably will happen, blah, blah, blah. Um, but comparing, like, fall and March, they're, they're sort of similar, you know, the, the fish are waking up in March and the, in October they're charting to pair for the cold. But the biggest difference is the weather consistent is more consistent in the fall. And so they, they're eating harder versus the, the spring, uh, March time frame where they're, they can eat real big and then there can be a weather change. And then they're kind of like, they're sluggish. They don't need to eat as much. And then you got to wait for that next change. But um, I'd say any time around the first of March, unless it's just brutally cold still. Um, the coldest I've caught them in is 46 degrees. I would, I would like to see 50 and over water temperatures. Uh, but the coldest I've caught them is 46. And, uh, and you're going to have to work for them in 46, but it can be done. How, how have the spawns been there on the river? I know we kind of, we, we, we <clears throat> talked a little bit about it off camera. Um, I know that like the Shenandoah, for example, you know, my home water, we had a, a horrendous fish kill back when I was a kid. I think it was like 75% mortality mm -hmm. on the main stem. 50% on the forks. Like, has the James River been doing fairly well when it comes to its reproductive smallmouth population? Um, <clears throat> lately, yes. Uh, we had, I'm trying to think of years, but it was probably, oh, 14, 15, 13. Somewhere in there, we had like a three year period where they didn't get any, any, any good spawns. Um, uh, which what happened is in, in like 2016, no, yeah, I guess it was, it would be 13. So 13, 14, 15, 16. Yeah. Those years we had a lot of big fish. Um, we had a lot of fish in the 16 and upper, a, a you know, 16 inch upper class fish. And, uh, and the reason was, is we had all these age gaps you know, weren't seeing those small fish because of those poor spawns prior, right? So what happened is um, those fish are obviously going to die. I mean, they don't live forever, you know, 10 years probably max in perfect conditions. So, um, you know, at, then then we got into some bad years. What I would say is like probably uh, 18, 19, I think were kind of tough on James for me as far as fish numbers. Um, I was still finding big fish. You know, it was still worth my while there, but the numbers weren't there much. And what I noticed last year is we must have had, you know, 
and I go by more what I see, not by what I read when I talk about the spawn. Um, so the past few years, I've seen a lot of fry. Um, you know, after that key time of early June, you know, seeing them, you know, throughout the summer in certain areas. And over the past three years, our numbers of fish just really climbed as far as that um, eight, six to 13 inch fish are just really higher, you know, a lot higher than they were. So we had, I, we had to have some good spawns throughout the past few years to get those numbers up. And uh, I'm really excited to see what it's like this year. You know, because those those bigger ones, the 13s, are going to grow a little bit more. And so, in the next few years, we're going to have some, you know, good numbers of, of uh, fun catching fish size with big fish still. There's still plenty um, of big smallmouth around. Um, I, I work a little bit harder to find them, but once I find them, I can find them a little more consistently than I used to back, you know, years, years back. But... Um, you know, the spawn is, other than the catfish, the spawn is our number one in, enemy. If we have a bad spawn, then, you know, especially three or four years in a row, whew, you're going to have a bad period at some point. And I had the bother just warn me. He said, enjoy it. Because he said about, you know, 18, 19, 20, you know, 2018, 2019, we were going to see, you know, a decline in the fish. And I did, you know, far as numbers go. But, um, you know, some sections I've seen a lot of fish in it, but they're younger fish, but they're, they'll grow up, they'll grow up and they'll disperse, you know, they'll, they'll move around and find their own territories and where they like to spawn and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, hopefully like we, we get some supplemental stocking too, because I know at least on, on some of the rivers up near us, like that's something where if we could figure out how to make smallmouth reproduce, you know, cheaply, like that's something I feel like our Virginia could definitely benefit from because of all the smallmouth we have. I think we have, you know, especially on, on the on the James down um, in my neck of the woods. I think we have a lot of fish that will leave, excuse me, and spawn up creeks, you know, bigger river or you know, bigger creeks, you know, and um, that can be a saving grace if the bigger river, you know, blows out. Now, a lot of times those big fish don't stay; they'll move back out to the main river, but. Um, you know, that, that can be a saving grace with, uh, if we get those high waters, you know, near late May and early June, which is what I understand being the worst thing that can happen after the, the, the spawn. Um, and, um, you know, just talking about spawn, like I said earlier, I don't fish for them. You know, if they're bedded, I don't, I don't fish for them. I got enough other things I can go do. And uh, just because I care about them, I don't want to, I need them. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see statewide catch and release for smallmouth, but, uh, um, you know, so I leave them alone and, and, uh, when they're spawning and, and let them do their thing and hopefully we'll have more fish. Cause when I grew up, you know, I grew up 10 minutes from the James river and, um, I spent, um, uh, a lot of evenings with my father in the summer wade fishing and, and, in those days, it was nothing to catch, oh gosh, 35 in the evening, you know, maybe more than that, just fishing a Mr. Twister, you know, Mr. Twister. And then right before the dark, we'd switch over, we'd switch over to a Rapala, you know, a little two inch floating Rapala. And, um, but I'll tell you the difference then. We had big, big numbers of fish then, but they were all, gosh, they were all the same size, it seemed like. You know, like I never caught fish bigger than 16 inches and it wasn't until i became an adult and actually moved away from from the state of virginia and came back that i started to find bigger fish and what i noticed the population wasn't as high as it once was it's was still very good but it wasn't as high as it was when i was a kid but i started catching those bigger fish those citation fish that i've always wanted in my life you know even when i was young you know every everybody wants to catch a big fish whether you're five or 75 but um so that's the biggest difference and i don't know why that is um uh, i think it's kind of funny you know we the are kind of weird and i think you know as far as you know we, we take a lot better care of the water than we used to you know uh, rivers are cleaner than they used to be 
and it's always blown my mind we have less fish than we used to so but i just kind of think well maybe it's angling pressure maybe it's just more anglers you know and that's what hurts it you know that's why it's not the way it was when i was a kid um i don't know uh but it's um is there a lot of angling pressure depending on where you are it depends on where you are um on the on the river there's certain areas that get more pressure than other like the cannon gets a lot of more, lot more pressure that upper river uh scottsville is well known um but it just depends on where you are how easy the access is and that sort of thing and what i i tell you what i'd love to see uh happen and i mean this is something i could do personally but uh, my outreach is not as big as say the department of you know wildlife resources uh, is teaching fish handling techniques you know what, what do you do when a fish uh gets hooked in his throat uh what do you do when a fish is bleeding uh, that sort of thing um so if you care about the fish you know if we handle the fish well they have a much higher chance of uh, surviving and uh, i think if you're catch and release fishermen then you know learn proper handling techniques use a net if you're if you're boat fishing use a net make it easy on the fish make it easy on you um that sort of stuff would be a good teaching tool for people that uh, may not know you know um keeping the fish out of the water too long that sort of thing making sure the fish is ready to leave you know ready to swim off don't just throw it back in it is interesting I will. Oh, oh go go Oh, I was going to say with like the bigger fish, like I'd say, you know, 16 inches and above, I will hold those fish with my thumb in the water until they bite me and jerk. I won't let them go until that point. And I watch anglers, you know, land a fish, unhook it and just flip it back in. And, you know, you got to understand those older fish, they, they're old. I mean, it takes them a longer time to recover. So you know, let them revive, whether you do it the way I do it or just leave them in the net, just give them more time to, to get their strength back before you let them take off. Do you think that also has to do with your background in fly fishing? Because from what I've, I've been blessed with this podcast to be able to talk to so many different people and different tribes of fishing and trout anglers, the the real ones that use fly rods and stuff and musky anglers Mm -hmm. treat the fish. Like it's almost like a, a, you know, a sacred cow in India when they land it, they take extremely yeah. good care of it. Yeah. Bass guys, hey, I'm guilty of this. I fish college tournaments. You know, we don't necessarily mm-hmm. culturally, I guess, treat them very well. And do you think that's where it comes from your background of like having that trout fishing mindset? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just too. It's just me caring about them. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to catch them again. You know, and and. um you know, it's like when people ask me, do you keep fish? And I said, well, I'm not into killing my business partner. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's really a damn good line. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these, these fish are worth more to me alive than they are dead. And, um, and I like fish. I like saltwater fish more than freshwater fish as far as eating. But, um, you know, they're worth a lot more to me alive and I want to take care of them. And I know catch and release works. I know it works. Now I know there is a, there is mortality with it. But I know it works because I've caught plenty of fish with identifying marks and I've caught them again, um, you know, throughout the year. So I know it works if you do it right. And, and um, I actually learned a lot from uh, uh, Steve Tachonis about like getting a deep hook out of a fish without hurting it and, and using the, you know, pushing down on the thumb, you know, pushing the thumb down on the, the eye of the hook and popping it out of his, his throat or gullet, whatever you want to call it there. And um, I've actually gone to extent of, I started out with like Coke and seven up, like if a fish is bleeding, that, that citric acid will help clot to buying, um, oh gosh, what's the stuff called? It's the tournament stuff now. G-juice? Um, G-juice. So I've, I've gone to the point of buying G-juice and putting it in a squirt bottle. So if I catch a bass, no matter its size, I don't care if it's 12, 10, 8, if it's bleeding, I will squirt it with G-Juice and make sure he's ready to go. That worked? Really? That is so cool. Yeah. I actually got a video on, um, it's a reel on Instagram of me doing it on about a 12-incher that was bleeding. And I squirt the G-Juice on it and you can see it clot right away. So hopefully he lived, you know. 
<laughs> he swam away. <laughs> he swam away. Okay. Population. <laughs> Dude, that's freaking brilliant. Yeah. I've never heard of doing it that way. Yeah. I, I've heard of using G juice in your live well, but never. Mm -hmm. That's a brilliant idea. Yeah, I actually learned uh, about the G juice from a friend in North Carolina that he has a buddy that's a tournament angler. And he gave me the idea of putting it in. Yep, there's a video. Uh, he gave me the idea of putting it in the uh, squirt bottle. And just using it, you know, I didn't dilute it or nothing. And, uh, and, uh, you know, that's how I use it. Okay. I'm going to do that this year. That's insane. I never, that is such a brilliant little hack there versus using Mountain Dew mm -hmm. or something like that. Well, yeah, the problem with Mountain Dew, you know, too, you, you use too much of it or you pour it or you decide to drink it, <laughs> you know, so um, but how good is that but, shit when, uh, when they use it to like clean off pennies and rusted crap and we're going to shove that in a yeah. fish's mouth? Like, I, I don't know if that's best for them. Yeah. I mean, the science is there with the G juice. So I just trust it. And like I said, I've never used it in live well or anything like that, but I trust it. Um, and uh, especially with terminal anglers, because the last thing terminal angler wants is a fish to die. Yeah. Right. Because then, then he can't weigh. He's, you know, he loses points or whatever. So, um, yeah, it worked. You know, um, I didn't have to use as much as I normally do this year, but I, I did use it. I keep it, keep it right beside me in my boat compartment so I can pull it out real quick and, um, you know, get it in them. And then I just hold them in the water until he's ready, ready to go. So, hmm. Um, I had a fish one time, this was before G juice, before I knew what it was. I had a fish, it was about 17 inches that got hooked in the gill slots by a fly. And when I, when I went, you know, when I pulled it, obviously blood started pouring and I, I took a coat, poured it, it just kept going. Uh, so I even took cold water because it was summer, just trying to get it to stop. And I watched that fish's color, like, leave its body. Like, you can see the color change in their body. It's usually a bad sign. But I just kept holding him, and it probably took 10 minutes, and he eventually swam away, went to the bottom, and was sitting, you know, upright. Now, he could have died later, but if I would have let go of him, he would have went belly up because I tried, and I just re-netted him. So I think if we take a little more time – on releasing those fish that look exhausted or got hooked bad, that they might have a chance. You know, it's it's better than just tossing them and say, "Oh, a turtle will eat it." You know, I'd rather have a chance of living. At least hope hope it does. How did you and so, and Captain Chaconis meet? A uh, mutual client. Um, yeah, a mutual client of his um, does some fly fishing as well, and wanted I heard about me through Orvis Arlington store and um booked a trip and Steve came along and what was funny is I loved having Steve because he's a wealth of knowledge and information and and um I liked asking him about techniques that I don't do like drop shots stuff like that I'm like oh how do you think drop shot will work in moving water that sort of stuff and and so he got interested in fly fishing so the first time he came they fished two or three days didn't he didn't fly fish and then he now when he comes he fly fishes instead of spin fishing it's the only time he fly fishes when he comes fishing with me now uh, i think he does some more on his own now but uh he he won't pick up a spinner rod he won't even bring it with him when he comes fishing with me now he he likes it and uh it's funny uh the similarities that he finds between fly fishing and, and spin fishing you know um, obviously it's a little bit harder cause we have more time to wait for as things sinking down, but, uh, he enjoys it when he comes. I think that's something I've added to my bucket list. Like I want to start getting into is more fly fishing. Cause I think it just makes you a better mm -hmm. angler. It teaches you how to recurrent, I think way better than just using spin tackle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the reason, the reason is, is you can't cover as much water as you, you can with spin gear. So you have to, you're forced to learn more where the fish want to be and what the holding spots are and that way you're not wasting time in the other water yeah. that makes sense because the spin rod you know i'd cast it further i'd cast it i can cast flower very accurately but spin rod i can too but i can cover different depths of water column 
I can cover different distance in the water. But with a fly, I'm, I'm limited on what I can reach, where, where, what I can sink down into. So I have to be more precise on learning where the fish wants to be um, that day or that time frame, and then target that. And then I don't have to worry about the rest of the water. And that was one thing that Steve kind of talked about liking about fly fishing so because when we make a cast whether it's a bait cast or or a spinning reel what do we do we have to reel it all the way back right mm -hmm. every time well if i make a 40 foot cast with a fly rod and i fish a little bit of a section and it doesn't eat all i do is pick up and recast right back so i'm keeping my fly in that that feeding zone or fish zone or whatever you want to call it longer and quicker than I can with the spin reel because I have to reel back in recast every time and I can just pick up and throw it right back and get it right back to the fish a lot quicker with a fly rod. So there is advantages and disadvantages. Um, I, I will say this, I always tell people this, especially if they're thinking about trying fly fishing is you don't, you don't start fly fishing because it's the better way. If I had to feed my family, I would go buy worms, <laughs> dig up worms and use a spinner on it. Right. I fly fish because it's it's my preferred way because of the challenge aspect. I'm a bow hunter. I, that's what I was about to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a bow hunter, so I like the challenge. I like having to get closer. I like having to work a little bit harder for it. I think it's just more um, more rewarding for me when I catch a fish, and and that's why I do it. Uh, I have nothing against spin fishing or bait casting, and I guide. Uh, spin fishermen all the time for smallmouth, and and uh, I do a lot of trips where I'll have like one fly angler and one spin angler, um, which I always put the spin angler in the back of the boat because he's usually going to outfish the fly guy anyways. But um, but uh, yeah, it, I, I I have no quarrels with with spin fishing. I I I, uh, I look at it as a day off and a break from fly fishing sometimes, and it's just nice to you know just say hey cast there, guy hits it catch fish <laughs> so matt uh we've covered a lot today uh for your for your first intro to this this crazy thing that i'm doing um if people want to book a trip with you is the website the best place to do it yeah i mean my website uh it has a contact form that you can send me an email and it'll ask you a few questions like you know what river what fish species you're looking for or my phone number's right on there you can uh uh, feel free to call me and uh, we'll get back in touch with you. So either one's fine. And guys, like always, link will be in the episode description. So whether you're on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, whatever you're you're digesting this on, you'll be able to go into the episode description. There'll be a link to his website and all the social media. Please like and subscribe to his Instagram, his Facebook, everything that he's got there. Please help support him and all of our local guides. Uh, and, and go check out the Upper James River. We're, we're definitely going to do more and more content on the uh, on the Upper James and the Tidal James going forward. Uh, then guys, like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, we're, we might be keep talking here, but this is over for tonight. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.